This is the paved part of the trail that runs between Issaquah and Redmond. You can see a lot of flare because it's autumn or fall and you see these trees changing color here. That's as nutrients and photosynthetic uh, cells are withdrawn from the leaves. So photosynthesis is done by cells that give green color to plants. Well, the removal of chlorophyll, those cells, produces these beautiful red, orange, and yellow colors that you're seeing here in the autumn trees. And these are called deciduous, or maple trees in this case. And what they do is they drop their leaves in the fall and they stay without leaves during the winter. And then in the springtime, they develop new leaves. I studied ecology as part of my environmental science degree. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, while becoming an environmental scientist at the UW during my college days way back then. I'm writing a segue from 2016, though back in those days I used something called a Go Motorboard 2000. It was the uh, lead acid version before they upgraded with nickel metal hydride. Um, that one had a 16 uh, volt DC, um, 4 amp hour 8S lift, er, battery that relied on Hawker Cyclone uh, 2S cells uh, linked together um, in modules. And it had like maybe six or seven miles of range when it was brand new. And as the, as the lead acid batteries faded, uh, the battery electric range decreased. Um, it did, actually, it lasted until 2016 about, and was still working in 2016 though the battery was so faded it could only go about three blocks for a few minutes before running out. And my wife Meg, being an artist, wanted to disassemble the T6 aluminum frame, handlebars and the rest of it, and turn it into a lamp and an art project. Uh, so that was the fate of that device. But at any rate, I'm talking about micro-mobility because I'm riding a micro-mobility device. I'll pan down. There's my shadow, and there it is the epic 2016 original generation magnesium alloy Segway Mini Pro by Ninebot. I've written and made several videos about this recently and despite getting into an accident on it yesterday and the day before I'm still out riding because I don't give up and I'm trying to set odometer records here and so what I'm doing is trailing along here between five and seven and a half miles per hour my battery's partially discharged. One of the goals today is to drain it to a lower state of charge. Uh, I haven't done that in years. I mostly keep it topped up. Not all the way, but towards the top. That way I don't have range anxiety, a problem that people with electric vehicles have when they worry about running out of battery before they get to their de destination or returning home. Micro-mobility solutions like electric scooters, electric kick bikes, the Segway self-balancing scooters, those are great for in-city use between cities like on this trail that I'm on. They're not going to replace a car. You can't haul a lot of cargo on them. Their capacities are typically limited to 220 pounds or around 100 kilograms. Um, they have the highest power to weight ratio of any vehicle. So you look at like a 36 pound electric kick scooter like the um, like the High Boy S2 Pro that will be featured in one of my upcoming videos. At 36 pounds, it has 500 watts of energy from a brushless electric motor and can go about 25 miles of range on a flat trail like this in sunny weather like this with no wind, sort of like this. This uh, Segway, when it was brand new, could go 15 miles per hour for about 10 miles, but through software and firmware updates, it now only goes around 11.3 before the automatic tilt feedback where it beeps and tilts the rider back is activated. Um, it's not very power efficient at the top end because it has two brushless 800 watt motors that will suck down the 348 watt hour lithium ion battery uh, rapidly, especially while climbing hills. On a flat like this, uh, we're looking at you know motor draw wattages of maybe 500 watts between the two of them or so. Uh, going, you know, six and a half miles per hour. I'm five foot eleven or just shorter than six feet, like 160 something centimeters, and weigh about 165 pounds or I think 
75, 77 kilograms, something like that. Sorry, I think in imperial units, not metric, unless I'm working with chemistry at small gram scales or uh, stuff. Then I think in grams, milligrams, picograms, uh, kilograms, um, kilometers, and stuff like that. I know that's more popular in the rest of the world. America was developed by the British, so it uses the imperial system. Not entirely, though. Like a, a British gallon, the British imperial gallon, is like 1.2 uh, bigger than a U.S. gallon. So the, the U.S. gallon is about 3.785 liters, where a British gallon, I believe, is 4 liters. Something like that. I'm not. These are from my memory. I'm not reading Wikipedia. I'm writing my segue on a walking or a recreational trail. All right, those are my thoughts for today. Um, I'll include some additional clips further down the line of this trail, but um, I don't want to jabber on the whole time, so here's a time lapse of more of the action.
All right, since the trail is closed, we're just gonna head back the other way and Spartan charge if we run out of power on the way back. I was gonna go to Redmond, but the tension network in my ankle and knee and hip from the accident yesterday means that cutting it short's probably okay today. It's beautiful. They're about to break a local temperature record here in Seattle. It's October 16th and it's approaching 80 degrees Fahrenheit. It hasn't rained for over five weeks, and this is a seasonal record high temperature never achieved before. The air is clearer today, though it's been congested with forest fire smoke from forest fires in the Cascade Mountain Range, made worse by the lack of rain and the unusual high temperatures. Now, whether or not that's global warming, anthropomorphic caused, uh, natural, the solar cycle, heating and cooling cycles natural to the earth. That's a scientific debate that hasn't been resolved yet. So it's anyone's guess. A lot of the research suggests that the amount of carbon combustion worldwide, namely billions of tons, since there's 8 billion people, when you combine that with aircraft, ships, automobiles, everything that burns gasoline, diesel, kerosene, jet fuel, wood, coal, or any other form of carbon combustion, when you add all of that up worldwide, it's measured in the gigatons or billions of tons of CO2 emissions. So CO2 emissions are the target of decarbonization. You have even oil company executives are now publicly talking about the urgent need to decarbonize transportation. That's where my latest several blog postings, for which I'll put links in the description, which I don't normally do, but I'll put links to the description on my micro-mobility uh, articles. Uh, they were in part inspired by my recent explosive use case of the Segway that sat idle for a long time, and um, an interest in electric scooters that resulted in my ordering a Highboy S2 Pro on Amazon uh, for just over 600 US 2022, which I did a cost analysis is actually less than my $440 Go motorboard back in 2002. When you adjust for inflation, that's $737.43. Uh, so the consumer price index relative cost ratio of this um, new electric kick scooter, which will be featured in one of my upcoming videos, or probably several of them, that is actually less expensive, has better range, better performance. It's just better in every technical regard, um, except weight. It weighs 36 pounds and my Go motorboard only weighed 19 and a half. And that was with using lead acid, well, they're gel cell, they're called Hawker Cyclone batteries. Um, so they're an improvement. They're a Swiss gel rolled style of AGM or absorbed glass mat. Uh, with a gelled electrolyte filled with fumed silicate. So the sulfuric acid um, is not a liquid, it's a gel. And the fumed silicate gels it, it improves the viscosity. So those Hawker Cyclone wound lead batteries are actually one of the most vibration resistant, durable types. Uh, that resulted in the Go motorboard battery lasting for over five years. It's just that as time went on, the range decreased. And this is typical of all battery electric vehicles as the batteries degrade. Now, vehicles like the Tesla Model S and P100D and the Type, uh, the Model 3 and the Model Y and the Roadster, they utilize the um, heat pump or air conditioning system on the vehicle to keep the battery temperature from elevating because lithium ion batteries wear out faster at higher temperatures. This is known as heat fade and there's a specific Wikipedia article about the Nissan Leaf battery fading in Arizona and Texas, areas where they have high ambient local weather conditions, high temperatures, uh, hot arid regions in the American Southwest, but also in hot areas in the Middle East like the UAE, uh, Qatar, Dubai, uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, large parts of Iran, uh, Persia, what it was formerly known as, um, some parts of China, uh, some parts of uh, Africa, areas where it's hot and sunny, especially near the equator for most of the year. 
Uh, in those locales, lithium ion batteries exposed to high temperatures degrade faster. So in an electric vehicle, that equates to a loss of range or uh, decreasing range per charge. It also reduces charging efficiency over time. So the net electrical efficiency of an electric vehicle is better when they're new and the batteries are new. I would also caution you, anytime you get anything with a lithium ion battery, fully charge it and drain it down to 10% and then back to full at least three times. This forms a solid electrolyte interface layer or an SDI layer that protects the battery from every future charge and discharge cycle so that you're able to achieve more battery cycles and longer calendar life out of your smartphone, your smartwatch, your electric rideable, your electric motorcycle, e-bike, scooter, uh, self-balancing scooter, anything with lithium ion batteries. You always want to fully charge them when new. And so that will protect them with the SEI layer. There's a huge Wikipedia article on this subject. Uh, I happen to be a battery engineer and work professionally designing battery packs and building battery packs. And I study and continue to study on batteryuniversity.com. Isidore Buckman, the founder of KDEX International in Canada, he's the primary author on the Battery University website. And you can learn a bewildering amount about battery chargers. In fact, KDEX, C-A-D-E-X, is a condensation of the term cadmium charger. And so his company was founded by building smart um, nickel cadmium uh, batteries. And NICAD, nickel cadmium, has an amazing peak pulse current output. Um, it was the first rechargeable battery widely commercialized in power tools. Um, the sub-C type can give out 35 amps continuously for up to 15 second pulses. Um, the problem with NICAD is they suffer memory problems. And so they actually last the longest if you discharge them at high rate and store them dead. That would be the equivalent of driving an electric car with NICAD batteries until it had no range, leaving it parked with no charge on it, and then using an enormously powerful like megawatt charger on it to rapidly charge the batteries to full before driving again, which is completely impractical. Nickel metal hydride uh, was the technology developed by Chevron Texaco uh, from Ovonics Corporation, Stanford and Irish Oshvinsky. Uh, they were originally, I mean, this that pair designed all kinds of rewritable CDs and all kinds of other technology. Uh, through a cross-licensing deal, they licensed nickel metal hydride uh, to Chevron Texaco Corporation, but Chevtex would only license the nickel metal hydride battery for use in electric buses. So Toyota went to Panasonic in the 1980s and they circumvented Chevtex patents and started commercializing nickel metal hydride batteries uh, as the AA or LR6 and then every other size and ultimately worked with Toyota to develop the Prius lineup of which there's been more than 15 million sold now including the electric hybrids from Lexus, their premium brand. So nickel metal hydride was the first transportation passenger electric mobility vehicle synergy drive combination energy storage technology that enabled brake energy uh, regeneration, uh, idle stop, uh, electric boost assist, torque assist. By integrating electric motors and a battery energy storage system with the gasoline motor, Toyota's hybrid drive trains are able to leverage energy that would normally be wasted going down a hill by scraping off brake pads, and they use that energy to charge the battery pack uh, that's why the standard Prius gets, you know, 38 to 55 miles per gallon because it's constantly recovering energy when the vehicle's coasting, going down a hill, slowing to a stop, and then it uses that energy to accelerate. When you go into the electric vehicle space, you see that significantly with the Nissan LEAF, LEAF stands for Leading Environmentally Affordable Family Car, and that's a lithium manganese spindle battery, which is a little more fade prone and, and less heat tolerant than the uh, NCA chemistry that Tesla uses in the 4680 cell or the tablet cell. The lithium cobalt nickel manganese aluminum battery is extremely high performance, long lasting, and is the basis of all modern electric vehicles. So that's kind of the micro mobility assist device, uh, e-bike, uh, electric scooter, all of these things leverage these same 18650 cells. There's 12 major chemistries available right now. The chemistries give a, a, a tuning ability for the manufacturer, so there's trade-offs. And a lithium ion battery is a box of trade-offs. There's 12 different attribute tables like cost, energy density, cycle life, calendar life, 
a specific peak power output, maximum charging rate, um, heat tolerance, a whole cold tolerance, hot tolerance. Um, all the operating parameters are affected by the exact combination of anode and cathode materials. The most common in consumer electronics like a smartphone or a smartwatch and most portable consumer electronics, uh, laptops and tablets included, is the lithium cobalt cathode and a hard graphite anode or hard carbon anode. And what you have between charge and discharge is the movement of lithium plus ions between the anode and cathode and that facilitates the movement of electric current or electrons in the circuit to perform work in electric motors. Usually through a variable frequency motor controller. These are also known as um, IFDs. And in, in, um, they, what they do is they can vary the cycle rate, so the number of hertz going to the motor windings. Uh, and they can change the voltage as well and the pulse width. And so they can very precisely modulate the magnetic fields in an electric motor. Uh, this, en this enables um, AC electric motors to act as a motor generator to facilitate a single motor uh, doing brake energy re regeneration while also being the traction motor. So what you see is electric motor technology is rapidly improving. The best one I can think of is the Raxial motor from Koenigsegg. Uh, Christian von Koenigsegg's a genius. He's a living genius. Um, and he took existing electric motor designs, like the ones used by Tesla, and optimized them completely into the Raxial motor, which has amazing power output. Uh, Panasonic is uh, working with Yamaha and Toyota uh, to commercialize ultra-high magnetic flux density motors um, both the uh, induction motors and integral permanent magnet or IPM motors. There's lots of cool emerging electric transportation technology stuff coming up in the pipeline for the next 5, 10, and 15 years. Um, I would go to Green Car Congress. Uh, that's the best website for following transportation energy sub subjects. There's blogs I publish about these topics. There's lots of writers and articles that cover electric vehicles. And they extend from every scale. I mean, they have electric uh, kick skates that you can wear, electric unicycles. There's literally a different kind of electric vehicle. They're not great for road trips because the slow recharging takes forever, so it wastes time. But if you're into slowing down and going on a slower road trip, then sometimes that's great. I'm going to see if I can find an outlet here because my Segway is finally low on charge. Okay, so if that's the bathroom facility and that's the boat launch over there, behind this fence right here near this small building, I found an RV pole. And I've plugged in and reset the GFI circuit. So you can see we're charging. The Segway was at 13%, so it was ultra low state of charge. Now this is in really rough shape. The plug was hard to plug into. It's contaminated and biofouled, but it has a high amperage 20 amp circuit, a 50 amp circuit. This is a 1450, 1430, and a regular 15 NEMA R with a GFI circuit. So I reset the breaker on there and that energized my power brick. And so I can accomplish charging now. I just have to wait. And that's the name of electric vehicle charging. Like I was talking about, you have to wait. So there it is. So I sat around in the grass watching other people. It was fascinating for, I don't know, the better half of 40 minutes. That's where I was charging. Cool, RV. This little vehicle is used by volunteers. That's my solar phone charger, portable power bank charging. That's another angle of the Segway charging. Here's an ultra wide angle of where I was sitting in the shade of a tree charging up enjoying my time. Here we got some insects. I think these are yellow jackets or wasps. They seem to be hunting. They go about the ground. This is an art shot where I just pull out from the grass real slowly like this. It was a fascinating little bit. Here I put the camera on my phone as low as possible and started moving through the grass pretending I was a wasp or the phone was a wasp or a yellow jacket. And it's interesting at ground view how everything looks totally different. It's 
fun to see how the phone focuses. We'll go check out the solar array over here. What's this? Like an insect. Ooh, what's that? And then fly up and see the photovoltaic panels. Oh, the battery bank. Oh, wow. There's the pull on the bag. Just like this. Kind of like the insects flying around near the ground hunting for food. There's another shot of a, whatever the insect is. Now this is in super slow-mo, so you tell me. It looks like a yellow jacket to me. And it's cool to watch the flying insect's wings beat in slow motion. So I put a gratuitous amount of this footage here. Sorry, my optical tracking of the insect isn't that great. I'm right up on it, and it was hard to track. So this was my best attempt at shooting video with my Apple iPhone SE2 of these insects. I saw hundreds of them. They came and flew, sniffed me, sniffed my gear, flew on by. Any thoughts about what insect this is? Leave them in the comments if you'd be so kind. Thank you. Alright, all topped up after that RV spot uh, pedestal power input. Solar charged my phone back up to 78% too. Took about 40 minutes or so to go from 13% to 63% to pick up 50% charge. So that gives us a net charging time of around two and a half hours. Given that the charger is 60 volts at 2 amps, we get 120 watt hours per hour. So that means the battery is holding about 300 watt hours currently, um, or significantly decent, uh, given that it's only lost about 48 watt hours over six and a half years. So whatever chemistry they use, the variation of lithium ion in this particular device seems to be very durable. Normally, you don't get a one-to-one -one conversion efficiency for charging lithium-ion batteries. It varies between 70 and 95 percent. So, if you have 100 watts of power going in, you're probably only going to see somewhere between 70 and 95 watts of actual power being transferred to the electrochemical storage in the battery, of which 99 percent is usually usable once the power is extracted from the battery into the electric motor or the circuitry or whatever. Uh, so lithium ion batteries tend to have a round trip efficiency in an electric vehicle. If you do the kilowatt hours of grid power going in or renewable energy entering to the actual drivetrain efficiency of somewhere between 80 and 95%. An internal combustion engine like the typical Toyota Camry or Toyota Corolla, uh, I'm picking highly popular vehicles that have been manufactured by the million for decades as examples, but those gasoline internal combustion engines that are fuel injected with emissions controls, um, they typically have a brake specific horsepower thermal efficiency between 25 and 35 percent depending on generation. Uh, fuel injection radically improved torque horsepower and fuel efficiency. So the amount of energy produced for traction uh, or moving the vehicle versus how much fuel is consumed. So generally speaking though, um, gasoline engine optimization was geared towards uh, improving power output and performance. 
such that we've seen most vehicles become larger over time. So the existing uh, Toyota Corolla is as big as the 1980s Toyota Camry. And so what you've seen with time is that uh, the population of the United States has increased its average mass. Uh, this is known as an obesity epidemic and it's caused by the abuse of simple carbohydrates, sugars and starches, uh, not enough protein and healthy monounsaturated fats, um, attenuated health effects that are negative are compounded, not just type two diabetes and hypertension, but uh, kidney failure, brain dysfunction, ADD, ADHD, dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, you see a number of health problems associated with dehydration, sleep deprivation or lack of sleep or not enough sleep, and the sad or standard American diet. I have written extensively on my blog, PriusBlack.blogspot.com, about the negative effects of the American diet. And I'm not preaching, I'm just teaching and sharing. You can believe whatever you want, you can eat whatever you want, you can ride, drive, whatever you want. I want you to be you. You don't have to mirror my lifestyle or clone my lifestyle. I've chosen an energy efficient focus, but you could choose whatever you want. You wanna be high energy and pay more for fuel and electricity, that's you. And if you've got the budget to flex on such a thing, don't let my ideologies shift your opinion. Energy efficiency is a trending topic because of the internet, which has an enormous energy footprint, similar to several medium-sized countries combined in terms of electrical loads. Um, running all the world's servers, cloud compute is really just a collection of servers linked together. Uh, it's called server clustering, and it was invented by colleges long before the internet became popular. In fact, it's because of college students that the internet exists. Research in computer science done in colleges, um, Linux, for example, Linus Torvalds, um, you know, scientists working at CERN. Uh, there, there's been a ton of innovation um, in the UK, in the United States, in Silicon Valley. Um, it took a lot to go from dial, like phone lines, to high-speed internet. It's an amazing history built on the shoulder of giants. Or another way of saying that is that today's 5G NR mobile high-speed internet is an amazing technology that leverages a fiber optic internet infrastructure uh, that was installed during the dot-com boom between the late 90s and early 2000s when AT&T and its competitors installed fiber optic internet networking all over the United States and elsewhere in the world. Um, the whole world is linked together by the World Wide Web or the internet. And that's what I mean when I say it's an amazing time to be alive. Never has it been easier to access information. One of my favorite websites, the Encyclopedia Wikipedia, for example, has articles in hundreds of languages. And so it's not just English, but Significantly, English is the most widely studied language through English as a Second Language, or ESL, programs. And so, most people in most countries know how to read and write. They might not know how to talk and have a conversation in English, but they can read the Wikipedia articles, even the ones posted in English. Now, not all the pages on Wikipedia are the same in English as they are in other languages. For example, the French pages, if I use Google Translate, have much more technical details uh, pertaining to a given article than the American English versions of the same pages uh, in chemistry, physics, on technology and related topics. I shy away from subjective reading on Wikipedia where the articles are biased with opinion and they're you know subjectively written by people with their perspective and opinion that are not you know they're not axiomatically factual or scientific in nature. Um, they're geopolitical and based on people's beliefs and opinions. Uh, those articles are frequently rewritten and I would call that content low quality. Um, it's so bad with the editing because it's peer edited by anyone who wants to edit. I'm an editor on Wikipedia. Uh, that some pages like the one for George W. Bush, the, the former president of the United States, those pages get locked. Uh, that way uh, random people don't get on there and just, you know, blaspheme him and insult his character by writing inaccurate false things or defaming 
insulting things. So I try to stick to scientific and technical subject matter if I'm on Wikipedia. I would suggest that the internet, when it's used as a learning tool, and when a human being uses their mind as a tool, great things happen. But when people start calling the shots, not so good. And you can see examples of this kind of crony capitalism in most countries. When I say crony capitalism, I'm talking about large corporations bribing people in the government. And it happens in every country. Now, I've heard from people that came from poor developing countries that the bribes are even at the small local scale with the local police, uh, local merchants. If you want to get your driver's license renewed faster, you can bribe the person at the Department of Licensing office. Or if the police pull you over, you can bribe them to not give you a traffic violation ticket. Um, in America, the bribery is done at the highest level between huge corporations like AT&T, uh, Verizon, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and the government, the Congress, and the Senate. The president's more of a figurehead and sets the tenor for the way things are done. I certainly don't have all the answers, more questions than anything else. Look at this beautiful river. It's kind of murky and low right now because it hasn't rained very much recently. Still beautiful though. air conditioned charging spot here at the Sunset Beach Cafe of the Sammamish State Park here. It's at the south facing edge of this building here. The entire roof segment here is a solar photovoltaic array. There are the power connectors. You ladies have a beautiful day.
Isn't it nice that this late in October it's this warm? Hey, it's the silver lining to climate change. What are you guys pointing at? Nothing. Oh. <laughs> In particular. <laughs> Aircraft or? No. We're getting our bearings. Out where the road, oh, okay. Where we used to live. I'm just, this is six and a half years old. What's that? That's it's called a Segway Mini Pro. At six years? Yeah. I, I bought it for a grand on Amazon back then just as a toy. Yeah. And I rip around on trails for a couple hours at a time. I drag the, I charge her. I've charged twice today. Cool. Yeah, I bring a solar charger, keep my phone going, and then shoot YouTube videos, which is what I'm doing right now, but I'm excluding you from the video oh, on purpose, yeah, unless fine. you ask to be in it. Yeah, that's fine. Only our conversation will be. Yeah. Hey, happy Sunday. Yeah, enjoy the weather. Oh, you too. It's the silver lining to climate change, right? Yeah. Wahoo! Well, hey, hey su summer in October. <laughs> these narrow path ankle breakers on a Segway, but if we go slow and careful, it's fine. Ooh, into the trees. Hello there. Hi.
Hello there. Hey. Have a happy Sunday. Too. Thank you, buddy.
Yeah, I found my way out. Woo! <laughs> that was crazy. That last section was extremely technically challenging with tree roots. Oh, glad to be back to civilization. I'm gonna call it a day now. I'm gonna go to my car and pack it up. That was intense. <laughs>